All right, our next speaker will be Christopher White. Um, and go ahead and take it away. All righty. So first of all, to talk about the things I like to think about, uh, I, I tend to hang out at the intersection of physics and numerical methods, meaning you know you got some insight into the physics. You say, aha, I think there's a systematic approximation I can make here that lends itself to implementation on a laptop. Let me go code that up and see how it works, right? And then you say either it works a lot better or a lot worse than you expected, and you learn something, right? And, and you, you iterate on this process and you talk to the other folks who are doing it. And ultimately you can learn a lot about, the, about both the physics and about how to go simulate things of specific interest. Um, no, I, so my background is in matrix product states and generally doing this sort of thing on a, like I said, on a laptop. But since I started hanging out with various quantum information types around UMD, I've been thinking more and more about how to do that on a quantum computer. And, you know, there, there, there are three pairs of arrows here, right? And the reason for that is that the things the physics tells you about the classical numerical methods you can then uh, leverage to talk about the quantum numerical methods, right? How you're gonna go do the thing, whatever the thing is on a quantum computer. Uh, and then that in turn will hopefully tell us things about the physics. So, so, so there's, a, there's a great synergy to use the consultant buzzword uh, between these three topics. Uh, a couple of, well, a number of specific areas. This is all well and good, but it's super general. A number of specific things I, I tend to think about is, first of all, uh, what we can do with near Clifford circuits. And that's going to be the general direction of today's talk. But I'm also thinking about how to use the, our, our matrix product state based understanding of symmetries uh, to improve NISC era quantum computations. Right? So you can use this, you can imagine using symmetries as a primitive error correction uh, if you play your cards right. Uh, and again, closer to the spirit of this talk, I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about unitary hydrodynamics. So this question of how you can get out something like a diffusion equation in a quantitative predictable way from microscopic unitary quantum dynamics. So if you're interested in any of those things or anything that sounds like even vaguely related to that, send me an email and I'd be happy to have a Zoom conversation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to, who knows if it would go anywhere, but it's fun to go talk about physics for an hour. Uh, so this is, this is work uh, I've done that comes out of random conversations. Well, in some ways, random conversations with Justin, who I know through from Caltech. Uh, but I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Um, but it also, it's motivated by work I'm doing now on thermalization with Troy Sewell, who is one of Stephen Jordan's grad students. I forget if he's JQI or Quicks technically. So the, the, the notion here is that, okay, if I think about a, a, a quantum computation, there are gates that are easy and gates that are hard. And that's true, obviously, uh, if I want to think about classically simulating that circuit, right? Because if, if, if some set of gates is non-universal, I can, I can hope that I can go simulate them on my laptop. And in fact, that's the case for many sets of gates. But also, in a long-term future, 15 years from now, error-corrected, genuine, no fooling quantum computer, uh, I don't expect, I can't expect that all of my gates will be in, implemented in a straightforward, efficient way. So there's a, there's a theorem to this effect, the easton Kneel theorem, um, that's saying that you, you, know, you, can't, you can't have transversal universal quantum computation. And one, one reasonably frequent division of the gates is into Clifford and non-Clifford gates. Uh, there are other divisions into easy and hard, but this is a this is a fairly common one on both the classical and uh, the quantum side. Now, if I, I'll, no, I don't expect I'm going to say much more about Clifford specifically. If you want to know about that, ask me. Um, 
but, but given that distinction, I want some way of quantifying how many hard gates I have, right? For the purposes both of classical and quantum simulation. I wanna go, I got a state. I wanna simulate that state in some sense. How hard am I gonna to have to work? One, uh, well, the way, the way to answer that question is to come up with a magic monotone. Uh, my favorite magic monotone, not that I, to be perfectly honest, have uh, the most well-informed opinion is mana. Uh, and I'll be describing in detail how to calculate that here. Uh, now, so those are, those are sort of the, that's the computational background. But if I think about the physics I wanna think about, uh, a lot of it is modeled by random unitaries. So in particular, uh, we've got this intuition that, that uh, thermalization, so, so this, the, the approach to e equilibrium should be morally like uh, a Haar circuit on a, on a microcanonical ensemble. So a, a circuit that's, that's random in some sense that I can conjugate by any, it comes from a probability distribution that's invariant under conjugation by other unitaries. Now, this is, this is obviously kind of stupid, right? Because I've got one deterministic dynamics and that's the dynamics and that's all there is. Uh, but the notion is that these unitaries, these random unitaries capture something essential about the physics. Uh, they're also useful in all kinds of other uh, contexts. For example, randomized benchmarking. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not really gonna talk about that. So you put these two together, you say, I've got this physics I wanna simulate, namely random unitaries. I've got some methods in mind, some sort of uh, something that, that works well for Clifford's, for Clifford circuits and doesn't work well for uh, non-Clifford circuits. I wanna estimate the badness. Right, and see what I can see. And it turns out that this is this this maybe tells us some interesting things. Now, what am I going to see? I am going to see that the mana, uh, this quantity here, is given by well, it's some expression in terms of the qubit uh, dimension, the second Renyi entropy of my of the state in question, and a constant correction. This has a, a nice interpretation as a, an absolute maximum mathematical bound. That's this log D minus uh, second Renyi entropy and a constant correction right here, which is, which is a fun little surprise. And if I plot that, what I'm gonna see is, is this. It's a linear, well, it's a almost piecewise linear. Now we can be more precise than this statement here about a maximum of a log and so on. Uh, I am going to be somewhat more precise in this talk. I am not going to be much more precise. I'm gonna give you the easy, the, the easy approximate calculation. Uh, we've gone and mostly done the difficult exact calculation, uh, but I think I can get through the easy calculation in the 12 minutes I have remaining. Uh, before question time. I could not even begin to get through the, for, through the more complicated expression. So what am I gonna do? First of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain the tools I need to uh, quantify difficulty. Those tools are, first of all, the discrete Wigner function, which is a discrete analog of the continuum Wigner function in a perfectly obvious way. Then the so-called Wigner norm and the mana. And these are really the quantities of interest. Then I'll, I'll explain how the calculation is gonna go. I'll introduce the, the big simplifying assumption that we're gonna make that makes this calculation really fairly elementary. So it's a delightful this thing. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll show you the calculation. I'll say what we see and I'll, and I'll make, tell you a little bit about fun things that come at the end of this calculation. So the discrete Wigner function. You all might or might not be familiar with the continuum Wigner function. Here it is. It's a thing that like showed up once or twice in my undergrad quantum class and then once or two, and then some number of times in like quantum optics talks that I had not paid much attention to until I started doing this magic stuff. But there it is, it's a, it's a thing. Um, it's, it's useful because it, it, it's one way of pulling out something that resembles classical phase space dynamics. 
from something like a quantum oscillator. So that's so it's a it's a it's a fun little tool. That's defined on a continuous ring. I do not want to deal with a continuous ring. Uh, I have a hard enough time with Hilbert spaces of dimension two. Uh, I do not want to think about infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So I'm going to define the discrete Wigner function, which is exactly the most obvious possible analog of the continuum Wigner function on a discrete ring. I just, I, all I do is I, is, I, is I take my continuum variable and let it live in like a Z11 or whatever. Um, now, one, one little caveat, because of this, this two inverse, that is a well-defined thing on ZD for odd D. It is not a well-defined thing on ZD for even D. This is a huge pain. Uh, there is some work on defining uh, discrete Wigner functions for uh, qubits, but I'm not planning to go there. Now, this is this is this is a perfectly natural, easy thing to do for a um, for a pure state. The uh, it generalizes to a to a mixed state, which is really what I'm going to be talking about. In again, the most obvious possible way. Oh, hello. This is a this is an operator space expectation value up here. Um, so I just I just promote it to a density matrix operator space expectation value, and that's like what is it? It's the Moyle transform of an operator. I yeah I lose track of those names. So I suppose before before I go on, uh, does anybody have objections, confusions about the discrete Wigner function? This is going to be sort of the fundamental. Uh, objects going forward. Uh, I have another quick question. So this Wigner function is defined is like, I don't know, like in general, the Wigner function is only defined for like real space. So, I mean, you, it seems so. So the cube, when you said that there is some like uh, people trying to define it for qubits. What does it mean? Ah, uh, so right. So the so I have I have taken. You're right. This this Wigner function is defined for R, or I've 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 taken it to be U one um, here, but that's 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 not a big deal. The first step is to discretize that. It's this step. Then you say, aha, this works for on-site dimension 11. It does not work for on-site dimension 12 or on-site dimension 10 or on-site dimension two. There's, and, and that's, that's the question. And I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm, I, that's on my list of papers to read, but I haven't gotten there yet. I have been satisfied so far to work with dimension like three. Mm, I see. This is like the dimension of the on-site Hilbert space kind. Thank you. Great. Yeah. One one other comment along those lines. Um, the this whole talk I'm going to be talking about really a single ZD, right? So a single Q dit. Uh, but everything I say is going to it will generalize in a reasonable way to um, products. So a chain of Q dits. Uh, just, you know, mutatis mutandis. Right, so, some, so first of all, some facts about the, uh, the Wigner function. Uh, normalization of my state gives you that the Wigner function sums to one. This is, this is a thing you can crank through the definitions and see this. Um, you can similarly see, this is maybe a little more complicated, uh, but you can similarly see that if I sum the squares, I get something that's intimately related to the second Renyi entropy of my uh, Wigner function. And that, that makes a certain amount of sense, right? I've got, a, I've got psi, psi star, psi, psi star in, uh, in this expression here. And the statement is merely that the phases add up in a reasonable way to give you trace of rho squared. Now, those, so these are, these are relatively straightforward, crank through the definitions, prove them yourself statements. The, a very non-trivial statement is that for pure states, 
the Wigner function is positive, all of, for every P and Q, if and only if the state is a stabilizer state. This is called the discrete Hudson's theorem. Now, if you're not a pure state, there, there's some small region where your Wigner function is positive, uh, but you're not a convex, you're not a, a, a statistical mixture of stabilizer states, uh, but you're still classically simulable, which is one of the one of the things I care about. So, so for our purposes, this is uh, that little caveat doesn't matter. Like I said, this is called the discrete Hudson's theorem. Uh, it's a theorem of David Gross. Now, given that fact, one wants to, you, know, you want to measure how negative this Wigner function is. Well, it sums to one, some of them are negative. So if I take an absolute value and sum it up, I got to get something bigger than one. And how much bigger than one tells me uh, how big the negative values are, right? In, in sort of the way you're familiar with from negativity as a, as a, as a measure of uh, entanglement. Now, this, this has some additional properties that are super useful, namely that Clifford, uh, Clifford operations don't change the Wigner norm here. The reason being that they just, they reshuffle the Wigner function. Um, and the way, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a way to see that, but I, I will merely ask you to take that on faith. So this is, a, this is a function that if I do the easy operations, it's non-increasing. So, it's a, it, so this, is, this is what's called a monotone. It's a magic monotone. Uh, Wigner norm is, is, a, is slightly inconvenient. It's more convenient to characterize it by its log, which is uh, the mana. And that's, that's the quantity I'm going to be phrasing my results in terms of. Now, if I just, if I just like take this and I, I do a little Jensen's inequality magic, I will see that the mana is, is upper bounded by this quantity, log of the Q-dit dimension minus the second Rennie entropy. Uh, this bound, I, I, think the, I don't think this is saturated. I know for Q trits, it is not saturated. Uh, the, it's like 20% higher than the actual maximum that you can go and find by like numerical optimization. Um, so this is, so this, is a, this is a loose bound. This is one of the things that makes the result that we're a constant correct, that the average is a constant correction away from this bound is, that's, this is one of the things that makes that result interesting. Now we're going to see this quantity uh, ln d minus s2 over and over again. So I'm going to give it a name, delta, and a phrase to go with it, the entropy deficit. So I have, I have given you, I have showed you the tools, and I, it's time for me to move on to the structure of the calculation. Uh, before I do that, do you have questions about this business, this Wigner norm, mana, and so on? stuff. Okay. Okay. So the structure of the calculation. I'm going to start with a Haar state. I'm going to make a great big assumption, namely, that these, uh, that the Wigner functions for different P and Q are IID, independent and identically distributed. That is a, that is a, that's totally false, but it, but it works to leading order. And I'll, I'll say just a word about that fact. That combined with the, the fact that my dimension is, well, it's at least three. So three is much greater than one, right? Uh, means that I can take it as a, I can take the distribution from which I'm taking the Wigner function IID uh, to be a Gaussian. That's the parameters of that Gaussian are going to be given by the entropy of the state and the normalization. Given the Gaussian, then the Wigner norm and hence the mana are just an easy calculation away. 
So that's that's where I'm that's where I'm going. Now that major simplifying assumption. You'll perhaps recall that the the the, the Wigner function is the expectation value of some operator. But if I but I'm taking my mixed state the the this the state whose mana I want to calculate to be random. So these these the, these matrix elements are in some sense random variables. We've got some correlations, right? Because it's a because it's positive definite and so on and so forth. Um, but but the random variables, and they've got they've got coefficients that are like of order one. So so what this is 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 it's the sum of d squared random variables. And if d is big, like three, d squared is ginormous, like nine, uh, which which suggests that I can, as I say, take these guys to be to be distributed like a Gaussian, where again, the the mean of that Gaussian, the center, is given by the fact that the d squared Wigner functions have to sum to one, and the well, the second moment, you know, comes from this fact about the sum of squares, and then I subtract off the mean squared to get the uh, standard deviation. And that uh, that uh, uh, entropy def deficits showing up once again. Now this ignores some things. Uh, first of all, it ignores the fact that the row i j are correlated, so central limit theorem doesn't strictly speaking apply. But there there are two thing there are two obvious constraints on those row i j. Uh, they, namely uh, the normalization and the entropy, they translate to constraints on the Ws, but there are two constraints and d squared much greater than one variables, all of which are identical. Uh, so those constraints are only going to shift the, the variables, the, Wigner, the, the particular Wigner function values a little bit. My, my, my thinking is that they're going to go as d as 1 over d squared, but I, I, I would have to go look at my notes. Um, the other correction is just straightforwardly that if you do a central limit theorem kind of thing, you know, your higher cumulants go to 0, like you know, 1 over the number of variables or faster, but they're, they're not going to be strictly speaking 0. So they're going to be uh, small Hilbert space dimension corrections from that. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to just ignore all that. Um, if you know Justin, uh, Justin, let me be honest. Justin did the actual exact calculation where we take all that into account. And for d squared much greater than 1, which is where I'm working, we should be OK. Now, given all this, you know my Wigner function, it's IID uh, from a Gaussian with a specified uh, standard deviation and mean, well, the Wigner norm, har averaged, is just d squared of the Wigner function har averages, which is some Gaussian integral, right? You know, I, I, it's in fact the, sorry, it's the, it, the Wigner norm is d squared averages of the absolute value of the Wigner function, which is some Gaussian integral that I can compute. Here it is. It's not super hard. You can just go do this. Um, what's what's slightly more painful, and I'm going to ask you to trust me on, is the expansion in the limits where I'm either close to a pure state or close to maximally mixed. Um, the expansion in uh, the expansion close to a pure state gives me this expression. The expansion close to the mixed state gives me something that's slightly complicated, won't write it out, not too bad, but basically just zero. Now, how does this do compared to numerics? Uh, here I'm plotting the full Gaussian approximation. So this expression here with the appropriate, val the appropriate parameters in the green dots. And I'm plotting a variety of Hilbert space dimensions in gray, gray and black. And you can see that, yeah, here for d equals three, there's a, there's a perceptible um, small Hilbert space dimension size uh, correction. But by the time I get to d equals 41, 
which is the just the highest I happened to do uh, the, when I was rerunning these numerics this morning. It's it's uh, so it lines up almost exactly with the that Gaussian approximation. Get a better idea. I can subtract off this linear half delta bit, and I'll see that again. This is the zero here. You know, in this, if I subtract off the delta, it's that. This is the asymptotic correction. And I'm, I'm edging closer and closer to this Gaussian approximation as I crank up the Hilbert space dimension. So again, you know, this, you can, you can sort of be unhappy about my great big simplifying assumptions and you are, you are very much within your rights to, to, to be unhappy a priori, but you know, it lines up with the numerics. And also it, it seems to line up with the exact analytical calculation. So there's, so there's that. Now, I promised you, I've give, well, I, I've given you the tools. They're fun tools. Uh, hopefully you'll go away delighted in the power of the discrete Wigner function. Told you how to do the calculation. I've made my great big onsatz, showing the calculation and the results, but I promised you some implications. Uh, first of all, well, there's the fact I quoted at the beginning that the, the average, the har averaged mana is the super naive mathematical Jensen's inequality bound up to a constant correction, right? Which is already, which is a super interesting thing, right? That right there tells you that sort of most of the Haar sphere is pretty close to the maximum. Uh, one, one, I don't know if this is an implication, but I want to emphasize that I've been real sketchy in this talk, or I have leaned real hard on my great big onsides. Uh, we can be precise. We are being precise. I'm just not doing that here. Uh, there's a further implication. You know, I want to do near Clifford uh, simulations of hydrodynamics. That's a, that's a long-term goal. In order to do that, I need to understand magic and thermalization. In order to understand that, I need to understand how magic works in Haar states. And, and, and I've got a good idea, right? I've got quantitative predictions. That's a, that's a sort of CMT guy numerics reason to care about this result. Uh, you know, it's a prediction, it's a, it's a set of predictions about how hard different things are gonna be for me to go simulate. But it also has, I think, implications for uh, quantum info people. Uh, in particular, there exist uh, approximations to the hard distribution. These are called T designs uh, that are made up of Cliffords with just a handful of non-Clifford operations, right? So this is, the, this is the paper of, again, of David Gross that made such a stir back, what, January, February, uh, by virtue of being titled Quantum Homeopathy Works. Uh, so you can go entertain yourself by finding some discussion online about that. Uh, but MANA uh, gives you a fine-tuned, precise way to distinguish the hard distribution from those T designs. And that's, that's you know, on some level, it, it might, you might say that's obvious because MANA is designed to, def to detect uh, the non-Clifford contribution in these Haar states, but that's like a non-trivial statement about the, about the Haar group, right? It could be, or could have been that, yeah, fine. Some Haar states have lots and lots of mana, right? Because my random unitary can, you know, require lots of T gates, but most of them don't. Most of them are close to stabilizers. That could have been, but it's not. It's not the case, almost all, in fact har states require lots and lots of non-Clifford operations to the point that given a single state, I can tell you if I have access to all the, all the, uh, to the whole state, I can tell you if it came from a hard distribution or one of these near Clifford T designs uh, with very high probability. Is this sort of statement being made in the, in the asymptotic limit of large D as these sort of substatements always are. Now, additionally, and I, well, it's unclear where to go with this, um, but this sort of result you can use to constrain tensor network and quantum circuit models of the physics you care about. 
This is a thing we went and did with the POTS ground state and CFTs generally uh, got on the archive, what, August. Um, but I, you know, I think there's maybe some mileage to be gotten out of that idea in this case, right? So I have some system that thermalizes, what properties does my, uh, does the circuit that models that system have to have? Well, this is one of them. And that maybe tells us something. So again, interplay between quantum, between the physics, models of the physics, trying to get a handle on the physics, classical numerical methods, and like actually thinking about quantum circuits that would do the thing I want to do. And I think I'm out of time. I apologize for not leaving room for questions, but I suppose later. Or send me an email and we can talk on, we can talk on Zoom. All right, thank you very much, Christopher, for an excellent talk. Uh, if there's a quick burning question, uh, people can ask that um, while uh, Yunshan gets set up for sharing screen. Hey, Christopher, is there a yeah. estimate for for um, this thing? Like if the states are epsilon close, does that tell you something about the mana? I, I'm I'm not I'm not following. Like if uh, psi one is epsilon away from psi two, and psi one has lots of mana, does psi two have lots of mana? I believe so. The reason being that uh, mana is a continuous function, right? You know, the Wigner function is just an expectation value. You take an absolute value which is continuous. Um, the my my question would be if there's like some scaling that means that like the, the, the derivative term that comes in front of that epsilon is unpleasantly large. Yeah, I just worry because like S2 is not actually continuous. I mean, it, it's, it's continuous, but has a very bad Lipschitz constant. Yeah, so but yeah, I so- if the same is true here. So, yeah, so funny story. I actually tried to get a bound on the, uh, Thing on the on the variance of the Wigner norm out of these concentration to measure results, right? But they require Lipschitz, and and you know you think everything's going great and everything looks like it's going to work, and then you realize you actually got to know the Lipschitz constant. And as you said, the Lipschitz constant scales in a way that breaks the concentration to measure result, mm. um, which which for those purposes is actually super interesting, right? Because this is not some trivial you know, large dimensional sphere result. This is actually a, something interesting about uh, the about the mana and about, you know, how we think about Clifford's and non-Clifford's. But yeah, Lipschitz constants are, can be painful. Cool, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, and so our final speaker for today and for the symposium uh, will be Yunshan Liao, uh, who will tell us about many body level statistics of single particle quantum chaos. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, um, so I'm going to talk about this work uh, about manipulable the level statistics of single particle quantum chaos, and it is done with Victor and also student from our group Amit. I think you've all met him during the student introduction section. Um, why is it not okay? Um, so here is a little introduction about myself. Uh, I got my bachelor degree from Fudan University in Shanghai, China and then PhD from Rice University. Uh, my advisors, Matt Foster. And then in 2018, I joined Victor's group as a postdoc. Uh, my research interest uh, includes uh, quantum chaos, um, hydrodynamics in electronic system, and also disorder systems and um, manipulable the localization, non-equilibrium physics. Um, today's talk is about um, quantum chaos. So um, unlike the classical chaos, quantum chaos is actually very difficult to define and describe uh, because of classical chaos is defined as the sensitivity to initial conditions of the trajectory, but there is no notion of trajectory in quantum chaos. Um, so one of the widely used diagnostic for quantum chaos is actually the level of statistics. Um, many years ago in 1977, it was first conjectured by Barry and Tuber that for quantum systems whose classical counterpart is um, let me use the pointer here. 
So for those quantum systems whose classical counterpart is integrable, the energy level are uncorrelated and they follow the Poisson statistics. Uh, on the other hand, for quantum system whose classical counterpart is actually chaotic, uh, Bohiger, Strunan, Schmidt, uh, they conjecture that uh, the energy level should follow the uh, statistics of Wigeland-Dyson ensemble, uh, Wigeland-Dyson random matrix. So here's a plot for the distribution of the nearest neighbor spacing. Uh, for Poisson, all the levels are correlated, so the probability of finding zero spacing is non-vanishing. Well, for Wigeland Dyson, you got level repulsions, so the probability of zero spacing is zero. Um, there exist counter examples to these two conjecture, and um, and um, sorry, I thought I was phrased. Uh, sorry. Um, so there are counter examples to these two conjectures, but they are all very non generic model. Um, so this. BGS conjecture or the Wigeland Dyson level statistics has been used as a definition for quantum chaos system, whether it has a classical counterpart or not. Um, so, our goal is to understand uh, the connection between many body quantum chaos and the level statistics. Um, but uh, before talking about our work, I would like to remind you uh, the random matrix theory. So, for simplicity, let's uh, just focus on the Gaussian unifier ensemble. Um, it is an ensemble of n times n Hermitian matrices with the following distribution function. Uh, this ensemble is invariant under unitary transformation. So to study the corresponding eigenvalue statistics, one can just diagonalize the matrix and change the basis to the independent elements of the matrix to the eigenvalues and also the, uh, this unitary uh, rotation matrix. And one can then further integrate out the, this uh, unitary matrix and we get the joint probability distribution of eigenvalues. Um, it contains two parts. The first part comes from this distribution function of matrix. And the second part is actually the Jacobian from the transformation from the matrix element to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so the first part ensures that the eigenvalues cannot be too large. Uh, well, the second part uh, make sure the eigenvalue cannot be too close to each other. So we can see that when these two eigenvalues are identical, the probability is just zero. And so this is what one called level repulsion. Um, so the joint probability distribution function actually contain too much information because one is usually interested in a uh, matrix with large size. So uh, for example, one can just look at the mean level density or the two level correlation function um, and to obtain that from this joint probability distribution function, one can use the special properties of this Jacobian. Uh, it can be expressed as a determinant, a Vanderman determinant. And for this Vanderman determinant, it can be further expressed as the matrix of Hermite polynomial. Uh, in fact, one can replace the Hermite polynomial with any polynomial, but um, here we choose Hermite and I will go into explain later why. So put the Gaussian weight inside the determinant, the joint probability distribution function is just by the uh, kernel matrix, where the matrix element is given by product of this Hermite polynomial with Gaussian weight. And because of the orthogonal relation of this Hermite polynomial, the kernel matrix has this simple relation, so we can simply inte uh, integrate out the remaining eigenvalues to get M-level correlation function. So the M-level correlation function is again given by the determinant of this kernel matrix, but with a smaller size. And also in the large N limit, and it's a number of uh, matrix size, uh, this kernel matrix have this simple expression for the diagonal element and off diagonal element. So from these two expression in principle, we can get any M-level correlation function. For example, we get the famous Wigner semicircle rule for the mean level density. And also here's a two level correlation function and here's a pl pl plot of two level correlation function. So this R2, uh, we can see that it vanishes at zero spacing and for very small space, it's actually below um, the uh, connected correlation function uh, that is the corresponding Poisson distribution. 
Um, so the second part here is the connected two-point correlation function. And for GOE statistic, it is always negative. So meaning the two level are anti-correlated and repel each other. So the subject of our study is the spectrum form factor. Um, it is a probe uh, to um, study both the wrong range and the local level statistics, and it's defined in this way. So the spectrum form factor is given by the ensemble average of modular square of this uh, analytic continuum time evolution, um, uh, not partition function actually, is time evolution operators chase. So uh, express it in terms of eigenvalues. It is given by this expression. And we can see immediately from this definition that at t equals zero, it is given by n square, where at t equals infinite, uh, all these terms vanishes except for identical levels. So k is equals to n, um, assuming no degeneracy. So the spectral form factor is actually nothing but just the fully transformed two level correlation function. Here we have another term from coinciding eigenvalues, but otherwise it's just a fully transformed. So we know the two level correlation function for GOE. So we can just insert here to get the spectral form factor for GOE. Um, the first term J is a Bessel function. It comes from the Fourier transform of uh, mean level density. And the second term, we have this linear in T part and it comes from the Fourier transform of the connected correlation function. Um, here's a plot of the GOE spectrum form factor from this work uh, for various system size. And we can see that there are three different regimes uh, at uh, very small time, the spectrum form factor just decreases. Uh, where at the in intermediate time, it increases linearly. And at the time that it is larger than the plateau time, the spectrum form factor becomes a constant value. So it is actually easy to understand. So the spectrum form factor at time t uh, measures the uh, level correlation of two level with spacing of one over t. So at early time, uh, the spacing of these two level is very large, so they can barely feel the presence of each other. And therefore, due to the increased cancellation from this phase, the spectrum form factor just drop. And then at intermediate time, uh, the two levels start to feel the repulsion from each other. And that's how we get this linear ramp. And finally, at later time, one can no longer find the two level whose spacing is um, of the order of T inverse except themselves. So except for identical uh, eigenvalues. So therefore we get a plateau. So this is the origin of this uh, slope ramp and a plateau for the GOE spectral form factor. And this ramp actually, a ramp and a plateau has been used as a signature for uh, GOE statistics. Um, so there are many physical systems which follow the GOE level statistics. And one of the example is the uh, single particle energy levels for electrons in disordered metal uh, in the ergodic regime. So here is the two level correlation function for the single particle levels for this electron. Uh, omega is the level spacing. And the ergodic regime means that the level spacing is much smaller than the solid energy, which is the time uh, inverse of the time it takes for the electron to diffuse through the whole system. Um, so this result uh, was first proposed by Gokov and Elisberg and later proved by many others uh, using various approach. But one of the main message from these uh, studies is that the zero dimensional version of the Sigma model actually gives exactly the Wigan Dyson statistics. Uh, so the corresponding Sigma model for zero dimensional disorder metal is exactly the same model for Wigan Dyson um, ensemble. And another message is that the level correlation function is given by the diffusion propagator. So the connected part of level correlation function is just given by the real part of diffusion propagator square. Uh, so diffusion propagator is just uh, the solution to the diffusion equation. So it's one over dq square plus i omega. And in the ergodic region, when the frequency is much smaller than the solid energy, we only need to retain the zero momentum term. So that's how we get this one over omega square result, uh, which is just a proximal result for uh, GOE R2. So all of these studies, they only consider the single particle energy levels. So what happened for the many body energy levels? 
Um, so even for the simplest case with no interaction, uh, we actually do not have analytical um, derivation for the corresponding level statistics. So as a first step to understand the many body level statistics of quantum chaos, here we study a very simple model. Um, it is actually a non-interacting model with fermions occupying the single particle levels of GOE ensemble. So uh, one can think of this as a non-interacting many body systems embedded in a chaotic media. And this model is actually belongs to the family of such the Yeki type model. Uh, it is the complex SYK uh, with Q equals to two. Um, the many body energy level of this model is actually very simple. It's given by this expression for each single particle level emission I, uh, it can be either occupied or unoccupied and we sum over all single particle levels. Um, so it seems like a well-defined um, mathematical problem because we already know the distribution for the single particle levels. However, due to the huge size of this level, the number of levels, which is two to the power of n, uh, it is actually not so easy to calculate the corresponding level statistics. Um, we look at the many body spectrum form factor of this model, which is defined this way, and find that the spectrum form factor can be expressed as a summation in terms of the Fourier transform of this endpoint single particle level correlation function. And we sum over uh, n from one to large uh, n, which is the number of single particle level. Uh, I want to emphasize here that each term in this expansion is equally important. So this requires a way to sum over uh, infinite because we're interested in n goes to infinite limit. Uh, so we need to sum infinite uh, terms and it is actually not so easy to do the corresponding uh, calculation, um, but I will just skip the details and show you the results here. Um, so here's the uh, uh, expression for the uh, spectrum form factor in three different region and uh, they are shown in this plot uh, and compare with the uh, numerical result represented by this black curve here. Um, so we can see that similarly to GOE spectrum form factor, we also see a slope, a ramp, and a plateau. However, the ramp increased much uh, faster compared with the linear ramp for the GOE spectrum form factor. And another thing that I want to emphasize here is that the plateau actually, uh, the plateau time is actually the inverse of the single particle level spacing. Um, so this, we believe this ramp and the plateau uh, reflect the radio effect from single particle level reportion. And this plateau time then uh, means that the average spacing of two manipulated levels that repel each other is of the order of the single particle level spacing. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that another CMTC group uh, here at Maryland, um, Mike, Schalke, and Brian, they study a very similar model, the Maron SYK2, and they also find this exponential ramp uh, by just studying the set point manifold. Um, I, if I have time, I will probably also talk a little bit about our other approach and the similarities between their calculation. But uh, let me first show you the um, physical meanings of this uh, statistics. So as I mentioned, the spectral form factor is just the Fourier transform of the uh, manipulated level correlation. Um, so uh, here's the plot for the spectral form factor in the a linear linear scale, the previous plot is in the log log scale. So we can see that uh, the spectrum form factor drop uh, from L square to almost zero. This value is uh, very small compared with L and then it stay zero until it reached the plateau time and become L. So at um, T around the plateau time, one can use this approximation do the Fourier transform to calculate the many body level correlation. And here's a plot of the uh, manipulated day level correlation with both numerical and analytical result. And we can also compare it with the GOE R2. So the a similar um, point for these two statistics is that um, the two level are least likely to have the spacing smaller than N inverse because R2 is the smallest in this region for both case. 
However, unlike the GOE R2, which becomes zero for zero spacing, here the R2 of our uh, complex SYK2 model is actually non-zero because the second term here is much smaller compared with the first one. And um, also the uh, GOE's connected correlation function, which is given by the second term here, uh, is actually always negative. Um, so it, this term becomes smaller when the spacing is larger, but it stays negative at all level spacing. However, for the current R2, um, this connected uh, correlation function is actually oscillating. They have the oscillating sign. So we see this blue region for two level whose spaces inside this blue region, the connected correlation function is negative. That means the two level tend to repel each other. However, uh, if we stay in the red region, the R2 is positive, and that means that the two level tend to uh, check e each other compared with the Poisson case. So, um, so it is actually easy to understand this level reportion uh, for spacing small of the order of an inverse, uh, and because it comes from the radial uh, single particle level reportion. Um, but we actually do not know the physical meaning of this uh, physical origin of this level attraction in this red region. But this effect is very small because the second term here is small compared with the first uh, disconnected part of two level correlation function. So all of this is for the non-intacting model. So uh, what we are really interested in is the many body quantum chaos um, so if we add intaction to the current model or the zero dimensional disorder mantle, we expect to see a transition from single particle to true many body quantum chaos. And therefore the corresponding level statistics uh, should transit from the current uh, statistics, which is neither Poisson or GOE is something else, but it, if we add intaction, it's supposed to change to Wigan Dyson. So the Wigan Dyson statistics now is over the finely spaced many body energy levels. And the corresponding spectrum form factor should exhibit a slower linear ramp, which is connected to the plateau at much later time, which is inverse of many body uh, level spacing, the mean many body level spacing. Uh, but the current approach cannot be generalized to the intacting model. So here I'm going to introduce a different approach uh, which can be generalized to many body intacting system. And this approach is actually uh, very similar to what uh, Brian and Mike and Shao Kazi used uh, for their study. So we start from the uh, we start from the path integral formula for the many body spectrum form factor. Now the fermionic field psi has two copies, one correspond to the uh, forward time evolution, the one correspond to the uh, backward uh, time evolution. And due to the anti-periodic boundary condition at these two boundary point, the frequency is discrete. It's a much bar frequency if we just replace the uh, inverse temperature with the time t. Um, and we also need to average over this distribution of this random matrix H. So I um, here, this is again a non-intacting model. Uh, so it's the same model that we studied before. And uh, one can use the usual approach to derive the non-linear sigma model by first integrate over this uh, distribution of H. It generates an effective intaction term and then it can be decoupled by a collective field Q. So we can derive a sigma model using this approach. Um, and here's a corresponding sigma model. Um, I should mention that this model is actually very similar to the one used by Kamenev and Mazat to re-derive um, the GOE uh, level correlation. And we can now study the saddle point, which is given by this equation. And one can easily find a diagonal saddle point where each diagonal element is given by this simple expression. And for each diagonal element, there are two different choice. Um, so if we ignore this frequency term in this action, we can see that the action uh, is invariant and the unitary rotation of this Q matrix. Um, but because of this term, it breaks the symmetry, uh, greater reduce the symmetry, but we can still find the rotations that preserve this first term. 
and you apply this rotation to this diagonal saddle point, it can generate additional saddle point with non-zero of diagonal component if these two components are non-equal to each other. So now we have the saddle point, we can just study the fluctuations around the saddle point. So the spectral form factor is given by contribution from the saddle point, here's the saddle point action and the corresponding fluctuations around the saddle point, uh, delta Q here. Here we only keep the um, Gaussian fluctuations and uh, depending on the uh, choice of the saddle point, um, the, diff uh, the fluctuation propagator D here actually can take a different um, form. So for those that is generated by rotation, as I mentioned, because the frequency turn um, breaks the symmetry, so the action cost is proportional to the frequency difference uh, multiplied by uh, overall sine factor. So this soft mode is actually just the zero dimensional diffusion in disorder metal. And a special case of this soft mode, a special example of this soft mode is a particular rotation that preserves the E sigma three in the action. So uh, for the special case where A is opposite with B and the two frequency are opposite with each other, uh, we can find um, zero action. So these zero modes arise from the exact degeneracy of the saddle point manifold. And there are also fluctuations that cannot be generated by rotation. And for this particular uh, fluctuations, the um, propagator inverse contains a constant term that remain non-zero even for this case. So um, now we find these three different kinds of fluctuations. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that, um, so as I mentioned, this model is very similar to the one by Kamenev and Mazat. So in their case, they prove the diagonal saddles gives you the uh, mean level density for the GOE statistics and the quadratic fluctuations give you the level correlation. And from our previous study, we know that this gives you the slope, while the um, n-level correlation function with n greater or equal than two gives you the ramp. So this is also what we find here. Uh, the set point action gives us the slope and the remaining fluctuations give us the ramp. And um, to calculate the contribution from the fluctuation, it is Yingchang? actually quite- You've got about five minutes to the end of questions. Okay, so um, so yeah, I will try to wrap up. So uh, basically the fluctuations is given by the um, fluctuation contribution is given by this propagator uh, if it is non-zero, but if it is zero, um, it is given by this simple expression. And it was pointed out by uh, Mike Schalk and Brian that the zero mode contribution is actually just gives you the exponential ramp uh, because the number of zero mode um, is proportional to T. Um, so we also find that the other soft mode actually uh, contribute to the ramp as well because uh, we find the corresponding term in our previous calculation from the contribution of R2 and but to calculate the contribution from all the other modes, it will require a non-perturbative summation. Um, so the intacting theory is, uh, we are currently working on the intacting theory and because my time's up, I'm just to um, tell you a little bit. Um, so, the, uh, so the previous calculation of non-intacting theory shows that uh, the ramp uh, actually is determined by the soft mode. So it is nature to ask what happened if one introduced interaction. And what we find is that this soft mode acquire a mass um, that change the, your two level correlation, single quasi particle two level correlation and might lead to suppression of the exponential ramp. Uh, but this is still work in progress. And here's my last slides. Thank you. Um, so I'm ready to take question now. Right. Thank you, Yunchang, for an excellent talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. Yunchang, thank you for a very nice talk. I'm curious about uh, uh, the role of the, the symmetry. Uh, for example, uh, have you thought about a chiral symmetry? We know there are like, a, is, is, except the, there were repulsion, there will also be repulsion from the mirror of mm -hmm. the eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, so, so because I'm just curious about like uh, physically, I'm curious about if you were able to compute the many body level statistics for Dyson model, mm -hmm. uh, 
those those one with Dyson signal. You mean the other Dyson ensemble, like Dyson also, uh, also? No, no, not, not vegan Dyson ensemble. I'm just thinking those uh, with the maybe particle hole symmetry or chiral symmetry. Um, so your 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 eigen value will actually uh, be symmetry uh, around the zero energy. Right. So I think. Um, so what you describe is kind of similar to Marana SYK, where you have particle hole symmetry. Um, so I guess uh, it only the symmetry of the system only modifies the ramp slightly. Um, so even for the simplest case, if we just consider the single particle spectrum form factor or the, the uh, spectrum form factor of other Gaussian ensemble uh, with different symmetry, uh, the ramp is slightly changed by the, you are supposed uh, you are also going to see this ramp. So it might, um, so my, my guess is actually um, the ramp might behave differently, but you should still able to see a rapidly increased uh, ramp in this model. Um, yeah, so that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, I, 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 do I have time for another question? Oh. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, so yeah, hi, uh, Yunxiang. So I, I was gonna ask, so you mentioned about the, the plateau time, which um, you know, it should be exponential when you actually add uh, many body interactions, right? But I was wondering about the sort of the, the, the onset as sort of like the other, uh, the other end of the ramp. Um, you know, would you, no, 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 the onset of the ramp, like the Thales time, that's what, I'm, that, that was, what I was heading. So are you gonna, are you going to be able to see that, uh, for example, uh, uh, a thalus time that uh, that that that's, that uh, scales sort of uh, polynomially, or I mean, if you have to fusion, it's probably uh, quadratically with the system size uh, as you add in, as you start adding interactions in the. Um, I think so because we can just look at the soft mode, which gives us the uh, quasi particle level correlation, and the solid mode, uh, solid. Uh, energy is, uh, for example, for the single particle case, it is determined by this decay square, uh, which coming from the spatial part. Uh, and uh, this mass kind of act like a solid energy if the frequency is uh, much smaller compared with, um, so you can consider different region where the frequency is much small, uh, slow, smaller or much larger, uh, I guess. Uh, and also the frequency correspond to the uh, inverse sign. So yeah, I think that's how one can see the solid energy for the starting point of this ramp. I see, but there you, you sort of, you put the, the, the tau inverse by, is it, did you put it by hand? Uh, we actually calculate that for one particular saddle and find the exact uh, expression for that. But uh, this is all going, so we're still currently working with that. I see, because I was wondering, because you also need the scaling of that tau inverse or the, the Thales time or the, you know, the inverse of Thales energy with the system size or- Right, right, yeah, exactly. So our point, uh, our goal is to just, uh, because this is actually very similar to the uh, Ashley Elmer Kamenisky defacing. So they are able to calculate the defacing rate. So the mass we find is actually very similar to their defacing rate. And we are able to derive this expression uh, but it just for one of the saddle points. So we're still working on that, but um, you should be able to see the scale for the solid energy. That's my understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Yunshan, can I ask a question, Danny? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, so, so uh, one difference between interacting and non-interacting should be that the initial distribution or energy distribution should matter a whole lot. So basically the non-interacting theory can tolerate any energy distribution. Right, The yeah. interacting theory can't. Mm -hmm. So is that obvious or is it clear how that would show up? Um, so uh, actually I'm not exactly sure, but my current understanding is that, uh, for example, for the non-interacting case, uh, we have this one over omega, which gives us mm -hmm. the two-point uh, two level correlation. Uh, so it's square gives us mm -hmm. the two-level correlation. Well, with the interaction, uh, we have this mass, but uh, I was thinking that if there's a way to argue that the mass tends to dominate, so the um, so if this is no longer omega, we can still see uh, we can still see some universal properties uh, with different single particle level statistic. But um, that's only my guess. Um, yeah. So maybe so, uh, is there a 
physical interpretation for the mass. I mean, what I, what I mean is it, it seems like, I mean, it's, I guess you're calling it defacing. I mean, I guess, is it, I'm just worried, is it something like um, we're putting in some relaxation by hand that was not supposed to happen? For example, we're putting in an energy relaxation by hand that wouldn't happen otherwise? Um, or, so um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by by hand. Um, so yeah, okay. Maybe, right, okay. By, by hand, I mean, really, I mean, as an, uh, an, an uh, uncontrolled. Um, okay, I wouldn't, shouldn't, say, yeah, so uncontrolled. Like, for example, I mean, so an example of what I'm thinking is like, let's say one could have like a Boltzmann, like collision integral type, like um, uh, relaxation, right? Mm -hmm. I could just take quasi particles and then, so I could take. So one example is I could, I could for, of introducing interactions into would be by Boltzmann theory. Mm -hmm. I could just say that, well, the electrons uh, collide with each other and uh, they, 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 I introduce a quasi-particle lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and that would lead to thermal, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I see. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. hydrodynamics or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that's, if, if this is uh, fundamentally different. Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's different. So, for example, for when Ashley and Alkmanowski they derive the defacing, they they add this fraction by hand, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, argue that's uh, what one would expect from particle particle collision. But what mm -hmm. we did is actually not that. So we decouple the interaction by a Haber's strong image decoupling. So that gives us mm -hmm. the Haber's strong image field phi. Uh -huh. So there, it automatically uh, appears. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so this diffusion equation, uh, because the Q uh -huh. at the quadratic level, we have this. So uh, we, we don't introduce any um, uh, mechanism for collision. It's just the decoupling of the interaction term. And uh, if we just solve this equation, one should have this mass. Um, so that's how we get mass. Sure, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's defer any further questions uh, to the discussion section afterwards. So thank you very much, Yunshan. Thank you to all of today's speakers. And thank you to all of the speakers in this uh, symposium. This has been a very stimulating week. And it's been uh, great to see everyone in, uh, in one place and everyone talking. Um, so uh, thank you all. And we'll head over to GatherTown now. I will and repost I the link. I will take the opportunity to thank the organizers. They did an enormous amount of work. I think the organizers are Danny, Yangzi and Rushan. Am I correct, or is there somebody else? Did That's I meet correct. anybody? And also Robert and Cynthia, they helped. Robert, us. Robert yes. and I think Rebecca helped also, right? Robert and Cynthia, yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert and Cynthia yes. and Rebecca, yes. So, you know, thank to all of you. This was very successful. You know, the next best thing to, uh, to really having an in-person meeting. I mean, the only thing is there is no food, but there's nothing one can do. There is no virtual food, so. No, thank you very much. You did a very good job. This was uh, very good for everybody. Thank you.